Attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey. I'm the Executive Director of APA Ohio and Vice Chair of the New Urbanism Division. Um, today, Friday, April 11th, we will hear the presentation, Is Your State Resilient? Planning for Climate Change. For technical help during today's webcast, Type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen or call the 1-800 number shown. For content questions related to the presentation, type those in the questions box also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. And we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Upcoming on your screen is a list of all of our sponsoring chapters and divisions. I'd like to thank all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts free and possible. Today's webcast is sponsored by the Regional and Intergovernmental Planning Division. For more information on all of our divisions, visit planning.org slash divisions. And to learn about our chapters, visit planning.org slash chapters. And on your screen is a list of upcoming webcasts. To register for these webcasts, visit utah-apa.org slash webcasts. To log your CM credits for attending today's event, you can visit planning.org slash CM and select today's date and today's webcast, or you can select Ohio as a filter. And this webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. Some recorded webcasts are available for distance education CM credit. For availability on distance education credits, check the webcast webpage at utah-apa.org slash webcasts. And remember that April 30th is the last day that you can record your CM credits. Of course, like us on Facebook Planning Webcast Series to receive up-to-date information on our upcoming sessions. Just search Planning Webcasts to find us on Facebook. We are recording today's webcast and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Simply search Planning Webcast on YouTube and a PDF of the PowerPoint will be available at ohioplanning.org slash webcast presentations. All right, at this point I'm going to turn it over to Secretary Richard Hall to begin our presentation. Good afternoon. My name is Richard Hall and I'm the Secretary of the Maryland Department of Planning. And I welcome you to what should be a very informative webinar. Uh, there'll be a lot of discussion, has been a lot of discussion about climate change, but not so much at the state level. Uh, and we hope to address that today uh, with three great speakers. This webinar is sponsored by the National Collaborative of State Planners. Its purpose is to create a network that facilitates the discussion of planning of best practices at the state level and serve as uh, a place, uh, a forum, to have interchange networking among these state planners and to highlight what's going on um, at the states with their best practices. We have a link to uh, this collaborative on the current slide. Uh, this collaborative is a project of the Regional and Intergovernmental Planning Division of the American Planning Association, and I serve on the board. So we want to thank uh, the division, we want to thank APA, thank my staff here helping with this, um, and those at, at Ohio State and others, and speakers, of course, um, that helped put all this together and your time for participating. When we started Collaborative last year, we asked state planners to surveys what they wanted to talk about, what they wanted to hear about, what their questions were, and climate change um, rate rose to the top for discussion and learning more of what's going on. One of, the, one of these um, things that really unites these presentations is that all three we're going to hear about today, Florida, Maryland, and California, are all coastal states. 
and are all addressing issues related to climate change and adaptation, and they're focused on sea level rise, coastal storms, and related issues. Obviously, in these three states, um, there are many local governments, local jurisdictions, and they all play a very vital role working with the states to address these issues. So let me run down uh, very briefly uh, the, three, the three speakers, and then, and then we'll get into the webinar. Um, the first speaker, Michael McCormick, AICP, uh, joined the um, Brown administration in July of 2011. He currently works for the Air, Air Resources Board and the um, Resources Agency to develop tools that local governments can use to develop more effective plans and policies to address climate change. Next, Julie Dennis has worked in the private, local, and state and federal local government sectors for planning. She currently works for the community program as a community program manager with the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity in the Division of Community Development. And she focuses on asset-based community economic development through the Competitive Florida Initiative. And last and certainly not least uh, is Zoe Johnson. She's a program manager for climate change planning and policy with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. She's been actively involved in climate change planning and policy initiatives in the state of Maryland since 1998 and is the author of various reports and publications on climate change and sea level rise. And I've had the pleasure of working with her for a number of years. A couple quick facts from three states and then we'll move on um, that are relevant to climate change. California has uh, 3,400 miles of shoreline, 58 counties, 456 municipalities, 44 MPOs and regional planning councils, and 600 water management districts. In Florida, um, 8,400 miles of shoreline, 67 counties, 180 municipalities, 26 MPOs and RPCs, and five water management districts. And then in Maryland, we have 3,100 miles of shoreline, 23 counties in Baltimore City, 157 municipalities, and 10 MPOs and RPCs. Thank you. I look forward to hearing from our three great speakers. Great. Um, are we going to go ahead and do our uh, first poll um, before we move on to Michael? who will be our first speaker. So let's go ahead and open up this poll just to kind of help our speakers get a sense of uh, who's on the line today. So let's go ahead and get that started. Okay, I went ahead and opened up the poll. You should see it on your screen shortly. So it's just simply where do you work, what kind of sector you're in. So if you could go ahead and take a moment and fill out that poll. Wow, we're all over the board. This is great. There's a great cross-section, it looks like. I'll just give it another moment, and then I'll close it. Okay. Great, so you can see the results now. It looks like our largest sector is 34% local or regional government, 17% state government, 3% science or advocacy organization, 29% private, and 17% other. Great, okay, let's go ahead and move on into our presentation now that we kind of know who's on the line, and we'll begin with uh, Michael McCormick in uh, California. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to uh, be participating in this webinar today. Um, I'm very excited to see the breakdown of, uh, of participants. I think we've found in California that local and regional governments play a critical role in how the state can achieve our success around our own climate change priorities. Um, for a little bit of context, uh, I work at the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, which is a division of the Governor's Office focused on long-range planning and thinking about uh, how the state moves forward into the future. We have statutory authority over general plan guidelines, which are similar to comprehensive plans in other states. And we manage the, the state's California Environmental Quality Act. 
Um, we have a number of other core responsibilities as well, including being the military liaison for the state and uh, the liaison for most of our local government entities. And as mentioned by the Secretary, we have uh, 540 uh, local governments and counties that we deal with on a regular basis, so uh, that can, uh, that's a very important role for the state to serve in. I'm going to start. Looks like I'm having a little bit of a delay now. We didn't have a delay at the, de at the run through. Um, well, why don't you take control back of the PowerPoint? It looks like I'm delayed and, and it's not responding. And also, um, while I'm doing that, um, you can ask questions. There's Here's a discussion control. going on. Um, the Twitter hashtag NCSP. P climate, NCSP climate. So go ahead and ask questions or join the discussion for that. Um, and let me go ahead and grab your presentation and I can just do it from my end then. Thank you. So, you know, I think you know, one of the most important things, we're talking about resilience today, but one of the most important things we can do to affect resilience is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as much as possible as quickly as possible. It's been a priority of California to really focus on emissions reduction. And we're also focused on resilience because we understand regardless of what we do to reduce emissions, we know we're going to see impacts of climate change and in California we already are. So um, I think for the next slide, I don't know if you have that up yet. A lot of folks on slide, the line today, so I'm just trying to pull it up. Um, it was, no problem. It just shows the, uh, the relationship between mitigation and adaptation and the importance of dealing with both and in, in any policy decisions we make. Um, and uh, we've established a really unique policy structure in California to deal with uh, the, uh, the challenges of a growing state, changing population dynamics, and having to deal with both greenhouse gas emissions reductions and resiliency. The Environmental Goals and Policy Report is our primary overarching guidance document for the sitting administration. Um, it's currently in draft review, and you're able to look at this report on the OPR website. Um, so that's opr.ca.gov, and there'll be a, a little sign. As you'll see on the PowerPoint, there's a little, um, there's a little uh, image of the state that says uh, California 50M. And that is the, the, uh, the logo that you want to click on to get to the environmental goals and policy report. So if you could go to the next slide and then the slide after that as well. Great. So uh, the EGPR is sort of this overarching policy document we have in the state to look at um, priority goals and policies around the environment. Uh, under this, for specific to climate change, uh, we have sort of three, three legs of the stool reducing emissions, preparing for impacts, and researching and informing policy. Uh, for emissions, we have the Air Resources Board as the lead on the AB32 scoping plan. Um, uh, just recently updated, the, the draft review is on the ARB website at arb.ca.gov. Uh, the Safeguarding California plan, uh, which deals with uh, resiliency and really looking at the impacts of climate cha change on California and how we can address that particularly through cross-sector actions. And the third is the Climate Change Research Plan, which is really essential. We've, uh, we've historically um, had not, uh, when research first started, of course, looking at research across the board was very important. Um, but now we've been identifying gaps in our research and attempting to fill those gaps to help inform policy and actions moving forward. Next slide, please. So I'm going to really focus today on the Safeguarding California Plan, the Environmental Goals and Policy Report, and some of the implementation items that are coming out of these efforts to support our local and regional partners. So for the Environmental Goals and Policy Report, as mentioned, this is really a vision for the state's future, uh, looking at cross-cutting goals for the next several decades. If you think about 2050, which is the focus of the document, that's only 38 years um, from, uh, well, 40 years from uh, 36 years from now, sorry, my, uh, my math is a little bit short. Um, so my daughter, for example, she's two years old. She'll be 38 years old um, in time for 2050. And when you think about uh, 
how quickly technology moves and how quickly uh, society is is changing. And the iPad just came out four to five years ago. Um, cell phones just really became uh, part of our mainstream society 20 years ago, and nobody was using computers 38 years ago. Um, where are we going to be in 2050? So part of the vision of this document is anticipating some of the demographic changes, the population changes. For example, we're currently at 38 million people. We expect to have at least 50 million people in California by 2050. And with the impacts of climate change on our infrastructure and on our communities, it's certainly something we need to be looking forward to in the future uh, to address these issues. Next slide. So the part of this, we've identified cross-cutting goals within the Environmental Goals and Policy Report. Uh, decarbonizing the state's transportation energy system, as, as mentioned a little bit earlier, this is a, a huge priority for us. If you think about our goals for 2050 for greenhouse gas emissions reductions, which let's take the transportation sector, for example, uh, we would like to achieve statewide 80% reduction in emissions from 1990 levels by 2050. And this corresponds to uh, recommendations from the international community on where we need to go to avoid um, uh, catastrophic climate change. Um, and so when we get to 2050, what this looks like is that the transportation sector is going to need to be at least 85% zero emissions. Most likely that means they're going to be electric uh, vehicles or some other technology that ties into the electric grid or is supported by electricity systems, um, which also means we need to almost entirely decarbonize the state's energy grid. And looking into 2050 and, and the technology that's required to do that and the policy and infrastructure shifts necessary to accommodate that is a big part of the discussion moving forward. Uh, a number of the other cross-cutting goals around preserving uh, state's lands and resources, supporting healthy and sustainable communities, which really resonates with our local partners as well, uh, building climate readiness and resilience into all of our major policies, and improving cross-sector collaboration and data availability. Basically, um, fully instituting uh, an integration uh, process to make sure that climate uh, impacts and greenhouse gas emissions are reflected in all major policy and funding decisions we make at the state. Next page. So one way to do this is through the Safeguarding California Plan. This is our, our primary state guidance document on how to incorporate uh, climate risk discussions into state policy. This is intended to be a policy guide for state decision makers, and it corresponds to and updates the 2009 California Climate Adaptation Strategy, which was the first major cross-sectoral uh, adaptation strategy in the country for a state. Um, it highlights climate risk accomplishments and from accomplishments that we've achieved since the 09 strategy and recommendations in nine different sectors. And this is really um, part of this three-legged stool of our integrated strategy in order to respond to climate change. Um, in, in addition, it's supporting other state and local efforts as well, although its focus is on, uh, on state alone. Uh, local and regional entities are also responding to this and have provided substantial comments on the draft. Uh, the public review process is closed at this point. Uh, we've received over 100 comments which are currently being responded to. And we look forward to the final, uh, final version of this document in the next couple of months. Next slide. So we have nine different uh, sector chapters that are represented in the, in the Safeguarding California Plan um, with corresponding icons, of course. Uh, agriculture, biodiversity and habitat, emergency management, energy, forestry, oceans and coastal ecosystems and resources, public health, transportation, and water. These, uh, these represented uh, the impact sectors we felt um, uh, were most important to California. And understanding that there's quite a bit of overlap between many of these sectors, uh, we also have cross-sectoral linkages. Next page, please. And so the cross-sector linkages are important because they also link out to some of our other initiatives that may not be specific to resiliency, but do affect climate change. So um, thinking about how we grow as a community, thinking about our vulnerable population, uh, how do we accommodate uh, resiliency within the context of our vulnerable populations when they may not have the resources uh, to uh, become resilient on their own? Identifying sustainable funding to reduce these risks um, across the state and with our local and regional partners uh, in mind as well. Uh, supporting climate research and data tools. Maxi maximizing return on investments. So, and this is a really important uh, point uh, in thinking about how we move forward. 
if we are supporting infrastructure siting or projects at the state level that are exposed to climate risk, um, then that's problematic from a return on investment uh, for taxpayer dollars. And so prioritizing projects with multiple benefits that promote sustainable stewardship of, the, of our natural and built resources is important. And looking at prioritizing climate risk communication, education, and outreach. And collaboration, of course, is an important part of how we move forward. Next stage. And that in mind, um, in California, we've established a, uh, and this is, the MOU was just signed last year, um, it's a really unique collaborative of the regional collaboratives that are working on climate adaptation and resiliency. It's called ARCA, the Alliance of Regional Collaboratives for Climate Adaptation. And we're in conversations with other folks around the country looking at this model as a possibility of moving forward. It's a partnership between the San Diego region, the LA region, the Bay region, and the Sacramento region. who are all, walk, all working independently on adaptation and resiliency. Um, but there is an acknowledgment that uh, we don't want to recreate the we, we don't want to recreate the wheel, and we want to make sure that we're uh, working together uh, in the same direction um, and being able to go in on uh, joint uh, grant procurement op opportunities and being able to leverage each other's resources to support individual regional effort. And of course, with 540 jurisdictions in the state, uh, my office at OPR with 13 policy staff, uh, we feel it's very important to have a coordination point within each of these regions to support action. And for those of you from NPOs or COGS um, on the call, uh, each of these collaboratives have active engagement by their MPOs. Uh, it's a very important piece of, of the puzzle on successful regional collaboration. I'm happy to answer any questions about this as well. Uh, next page. We also can't, um, can't forget about our, our federal partners. Uh, the White House and uh, the White House CEQ in particular has been very supportive of, of um, moving forward with partnerships between the, the state and uh, the federal government. Uh, we, of course, have the NOAA West Coast Services Center here within the state that's been uh, providing support uh, for our local communities for a long time. Um, but we've really been able over the past couple of years to expand our relationship and collaboration with our federal partners. Um, so uh, the President's Climate Action Plan really helped to create a framework for this. Governor Brown, uh, Governor of California, is on the, the President's Task Force uh, for Tribal Leaders and uh, State and Local Governments. And we've been able to participate in these discussions uh, to remove barriers of how the federal government can participate in some of these discussions on resiliency, creating incentives for moving forward, and providing tools and information. Next slide. One important piece of this is open data and big data. Uh, the White House and, and Obama in particular has made it a priority to uh, provide access to um, uh, open data access. If you can go to the next slide, please. Um, we have also have an open data initiative within California. It's um, uh, focused on, particularly on the geospatial information, is focused on uh, the state uh, geo portal. And you can access through this, uh, through the website at the bottom of this page here. And the intent is to create an, uh, a connection to all of our important data sets within the state that have historically not been publicly available and provide a public access point uh, for that data. So we're in the process of, of converting the 3,000 plus independent data layers the state manages into publicly accessible data to support uh, external third party development of applications, um, but also to support our own uh, efforts internally at the state to help visualize how communities grow and change over time. Next slide. And CalAdapt is one primary visualization tool that we have, uh, particularly around climate change. Uh, it allows us to visualize impacts by address, by uh, uh, political boundary, um, and it's currently being updated to respond to uh, the connection to the geo portal, which wasn't available when CalAdapt launched a few years ago. Um, it's also uh, being updated to respond to new data sets and visualization tools that are available through our federal partners. Um, this as well will include a uh, an external API, which is provides third-party access to the data layer. So the folks can download the information or access it um, to support uh, third-party application development. And we feel this is really important to create innovation in the space um, and allow some really innovation use of this data to support uh, work at the local and regional level 
uh, and at the community level. Next slide. And uh, when we talk about, you know, oh, okay, this happened on my last one. Um, so this slide, <laughs> you can just go to the next slide. Uh, this slide uh, really showed uh, survey results. I'm going to have to resolve that uh, from the last uh, OPR annual planning survey that we did last year for our local partners, which showed that uh, for greenhouse gas emissions, we only have about 12% of local governments within the state that have not dealt with greenhouse gas emissions in one way or another. And that's a remarkable number, and it's in large part due to the push uh, that the states uh, had since 2005. Um, to support local action on, on greenhouse gas emissions reductions. From a resiliency standpoint, we have over 55% of our communities that have not yet addressed uh, resiliency and adaptation. Of course, this may represent uh, a lack of understanding of what resiliency and adaptation may mean. Uh, for example, our, our water district partners uh, may be accommodating additional variability in their systems, um, which is a resiliency measure, uh, but they, they may not realize that 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 corresponds to that sort of a definition. We have found that about 70% of our local governments that have dealt with resiliency have done it through climate action plans and their general plans. Um, it's a very interesting, um, uh, interesting poll result because we assumed uh, many local governments were doing standalone adaptation plans, but we really only found that 12% of those that dealt with adaptation um, did them uh, through standalone adaptation plans. And we have about 110 climate action plans within the state at this point, uh, which is about 10% uh, of the local governments. So one of the resources we developed to help support local action, uh, which of course we must acknowledge that the state really can't achieve our priorities and goals around climate unless we help to support our local and regional partners. The adaptation planning guide was one means to do that. Um, and this is available on the resources website, which there's links at the end of this presentation um, uh, to that page. Uh, but it's basically four volumes, four chapters that outline, uh, and this was done in coordination between the California Office of Emergency Services and the California Natural Resources Agency with support from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. It, it separates uh, discussions into four chapters and provides a process for how to plan for uh, resiliency and adaptation within uh, local communities. It helps to define the local and regional impacts using CalADAPT. Um, it identifies regional characteristics and uh, looks at adaptation strategies. So this is a fantastic resource to, for, for those folks that are on the call that are local. Um, we're also in conversations um, with uh, a few potential partners about turning this resource into an online format uh, to support action moving forward on um, basically creating a comprehensive toolkit for our local partners on, on dealing with both greenhouse gas emissions and adaptation. Next slide. Now, yeah, and I went through the slide already. Um, and the next slide, please. And so when we talk about how resiliency fits into um, our other tools, process guidance, and other linkages to plan, um, we have the state geo portal, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, we have CalADAPT to support visualization of climate impact. The adaptation planning guide uh, provides a step-by-step -step process for planning. And uh, we also, in, in California, have a Air Resources Board hosting the Cool California website. And ICLEI, uh, through a contract with the California Public Utilities Commission um, and the Local Government Partnership, has created the Seek California Clear Path tools for dealing with greenhouse gas emissions at the local government level. And this, this clear path toolkit was just uh, leveraged to become a national tool set. Um, and we've been pleased to have uh, this real comprehensive toolkit in, in play for the past couple of years here in California. So once we combine all of these together and the APG becomes an online resource, we'll have a comprehensive online resource to deal with climate. And the linkages are important as well, thinking about how this links back to our statewide policy documents our local policy documents like general plans and climate action plans, um, and local hazard mitigation plans, there's direct connection there. Uh, our our uh, state hazard mitigation plan was just updated and certified by FEMA and uh, it has comprehensive discussions of uh, adaptation and resiliency in there um, and other resources as well. Next up. So moving forward, um, we have a number of action items.
items uh, left. Obviously, uh, dealing with climate change is something that is not going to be stationary. We're going to need to uh, allow for adaptation in, in our policies and programs and science as we move forward. So the toolkit will need to accommodate that. And we'll need to continue active outreach. This is allowing, climate change is allowing conversations to occur that we've never had to have, had to have before. And it's um, linking folks together that have never had to talk with each other before. Uh, so supporting that, um, those conversations and being a convener is an important role for, for the state. Volunteerism is something that we see emerging uh, as is regionalization of these discussions. Uh, OPR is supporting in partnership with the local government commission um, an AmeriCorps program uh, to provide energy and climate related uh, support to local governments. It's in the final stages of review with the Corporation for National Service. We hope it gets approved and becomes a model for use in the rest of the U.S. Um, and again, uh, a number of other items to keep track of moving forward. I think the last one's probably the most important is uh, institutionalizing climate change into decision making. Next slide. And since there are so many questions left about how to move forward um, and leveraging the National Adaptation Forum that occurred last year, uh, we're hosting the first California Adaptation Forum in Sacramento, August 19th and 20th. Uh, we expect five, five to 600 folks um, from around the state, uh, some of our federal partners, and other folks working on climate throughout the U.S. that are interested in the discussion that's taking place in California to really help set a path forward on how we're dealing with climate change and to build a practitioner network and community around how we deal with climate in California. Next slide. And so these are some of the resources that I mentioned throughout the presentation. I hope you have an opportunity to look at these. Um, I'm always available uh, for, uh, for feedback or questions uh, after this presentation as well. My phone number and email is listed there. I look forward to the conversation for the rest of the call and um, look forward to hearing from the other presenters. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Michael. And everybody, don't forget, if you're very quickly trying to write down some of these resources, um, remember a PDF of this will be available so you can, uh, you, no need to write these down very quickly and feverishly. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on to our next presenter, who is um, Julie, and I am going to get that going right now. Great. Thank you, Christine, and, and thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for the opportunity to uh, talk a little bit today about some of the things going on in uh, Florida. I'm Julie Dennis. I'm with the uh, Florida Division of, uh, or the uh, Florida uh, Department of Economic Opportunity Division of Community Development, and I work with some of our um, different technical assistance programs. And the one I'm going to talk about today is our Community Resiliency Initiative. Um, our Community Resiliency Initiative is a partnership amongst, uh, it's, a, it's a partnership with our Florida Coastal Management Program, which is housed in the uh, Department of Environmental Protection um, and is funded through NOAA. We uh, also work very closely with the Florida Division of Emergency Management. And in a little bit, I think you'll see that we work closely with a, with a lot of our um, other state, local, federal, and uh, nonprofit and private partners through this, um, through this work as well. Today, I'm going to talk about um, a, four main uh, topics. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the history of um, this adaptation planning effort in the state of Florida. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we plan to do over um, the, the five-year initiative period. I'm going to talk about some of our key players and stakeholders in the initiative. And then um, I'm going to wrap up by talking about some policy language associated with adaptation planning at, uh, at the state level. Next slide, please. In Florida, we have a uh, long-standing um, partnership between uh, the Florida um, Department of Economic Opportunity and its predecessor, the Department of Community Affairs, uh, and the Florida Coastal Management Program. Uh, since in, in 1997, uh, we started addressing uh, coastal issues uh, through the Waterfront Florida Program, and that's where we looked at working waterfront preservation. Um, after the 2004-2005 hurricane season, we began to look at long-term recovery planning and how to pre-plan for long-term recovery in coastal areas. It was another, another issue that affected our coastal communities. And um, in 2011 is when we started the Community Resiliency Initiative, which is our current, um, current initiative focused on coastal issues and, and ways, to, uh, ways to address them. This one is specifically looking at adaptation planning to, uh, to sea level rise and, and coastal inundation. Um, so the reason uh, we 
the, the main purpose or reason behind this initiative is, um, is because in, in uh, 2009, 2010, when the Florida Coastal Management Program uh, put out a survey to coastal communities to ask what type of resources and guidance they needed, um, our coastal uh, local governments and coastal communities responded that they would like to learn more and uh, be provided guidance on, on adaptation planning to sea level rise. So this is, uh, this is the direction that we went in. Next slide, please. In addition to that, it's also important to note that whenever we were working um, on our post-disaster redevelopment planning initiative, or our long-term recovery planning initiative, um, we, uh, in working with our pilot communities, uh, some of the communities stated that uh, they felt like um, we should begin to look at adaptation planning from a long-term recovery perspective. Um, they felt like when a community, a coastal community is recovering from a disaster, there was an opportunity to incorporate adaptation to sea level rise specifically into redevelopment considerations. Um, they noted this because uh, there's number, you know, there's, there's funding available for redevelopment um, after major disasters, um, and that uh, the redevelopment needed in areas is largely focused in um, areas uh, subject to coastal inundation, and uh, that there's often political and community will for, uh, for change during that time period. So we saw them beginning to, you know, our coastal, our coastal communities beginning to look at, um, at adaptation planning as a, as a priority for, um, for, for those areas and something that they wanted to, uh, to learn more about. So it really solidified uh, the need to, to do this through the Florida Coastal Management Program. Next slide. And uh, one other thing that is, uh, you know, is definitely worth noting is uh, Florida's coastal counties contributed over $584 billion to in, uh, in 2010 to the gross regional product to Florida's, um, in, in, to Florida's economy. And that's close to 80% of our state's economy. So if there are issues that affect our coastal communities, they're important to us too from an economics perspective. And so it, recognizing that, uh, that large number, um, that's, that's, uh, that's another reason that the Department of Economic Opportunity specifically is, is involved in this effort. Next slide, please. So I've mentioned a little bit about uh, why this is important to us and, and, uh, and how, how we are responding to um, a request from local governments for, for information. But I also want to tell you, and I want to talk a little bit about um, what we're going to do over the course of five years. Um, this initiative started in 2011, so we're around, 2000, we're around year two, year three in terms of where we are in our scope of work um, related to this work. And in year one, we really focused on partnership building and information gathering and uh, in establishing parameters. And this is, this is really where we, uh, we built our uh, stakeholders list and began to uh, build our, uh, our stakeholders network and then began to uh, do our homework and do some research. We were looking at the parameters around sea level rise or sea level rise scenarios and basically trying to decide from a statewide perspective um, how, should we, how should we plan, um, how much water should we prepare for, when do we expect that water, uh, that inundation to occur, and, and where is that inundation going to be, uh, you know, what, what communities are going to be affected, so where is that going to occur? Um, and that's an ongoing discussion, but we began to do research um, uh, based on that, based on um, things that are going on at the national level, other states, and as well as uh, some of our other um, university partners that we're doing, uh, doing work related to that. Um, in year two, we're going to be looking at, or we're currently looking at vulnerability analyses, and uh, we're, you know, we recognize right now that there are a lot of different ways to do vulnerability analyses, and there's a lot of different tools. So what we're developing here is um, more like a consumer report for local government. So if you can imagine that there's a lot of different tools available um, from a national and a state perspective on how a community might uh, gauge vulnerability, we want them to be able to kind of wade through all of those different options and pick the one that works best for them. So depending on um, their uh, vulnerability, uh, depending on the resources and staff time and knowledge they have available or the funding or grants that they may have available, there are different uh, routes that they may go. And we're hoping that this document will help them choose the appropriate route. In addition, we're starting to uh, develop some pre preliminary guidance on adaptation planning and we're going to uh, select a couple of pilot communities to begin to work with from an, a broad perspective on adaptation planning. Um, in year three, uh, we're going to start working with those, uh, with those pilot communities, so we're, we're uh, hoping to start that up soon. And um, year four and year five are really uh, focused on outreach. So year four, we're going to be compiling all of the lessons learned from, from our efforts related to uh, the Community Resiliency Initiative from a historic perspective, from an emergency management perspective, and then in year five, um, we're going to be um, 
disseminating that information through um, through various mediums, um, uh, guidebooks and websites and videos and, and all kinds of different things. So that's our um, that's our five year initiative. Next slide, please. Please. Some of the goals of our initiative, um, and I can't I can't stress this enough. We really are following the lead of local governments here. It's important to us that we are providing the information that they request and, and in a way that is most useful to them. Um, we want to approach this at both the grassroots level and the statewide level. So we are, you know, working on this uh, through, um, we, through our focus group, and um, with, which has a, a number of different agencies associated with it. And we also want to support the efforts that are that are going on at the at the local level as well. Um, we see this initiative as a way to coordinate all existing efforts regarding adaptation planning in Florida, and we've hoped to create a forum through webinars and and other. Um, exchanges to, to allow people to share information on, on what's going on uh, amongst the experts that are working on this subject. And of course, you know, the overall goal of, of the uh, resilience initiative is to better prepare the state for a resilient future. Next slide, please. We have a lot of folks that are working with us um, on this initiative, and we have a lot of great, smart, and, um, and, and, and passionate people working on coastal resiliency and community resiliency at the state. Um, I want to point out that we, you know, the, the number of local governments, we have folks in Southeast Florida, Southwest Florida, the, uh, the Tampa Bay region, and, and, and in North Florida as well, working on, uh, working with us on this and kind of uh, and providing guidance as, as we uh, create these in, um, different tools. Um, we also have a number of regional agencies from the, our regional planning councils to our water management districts that are working with us. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a number of state organizations, state governments working uh, working with us on this. We have the Department of Transportation, Environmental Protection. We have the Florida Wildlife Conservation Commission, the Division of Emergency Management, Department of Health, um, and uh, the Department of State. Um, and these folks, it's worth mentioning that it, definitely that all of these agencies, for the most part, have something related to adaptation planning that they're doing specifically on their own. So we recognize that the Department of Economic Opportunities and Initiative is, is, is one of those, but there are many other things going on at, at uh, state government um, agencies related to adaptation. In addition, uh, we have been fortunate to um, have the involvement from some of our federal partners, from NOAA, FEMA, the Army Corps of Engineers, and, and the Navy as well. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, and also, we have a number of uh, private organizations, private sector and nonprofit organizations involved. Um, we have Plum Creek Timber Company, which is one of our largest landowners in the state of Florida, um, as well as the Florida Chapter of the American Planning Association and a number of conservation um, agencies, the Florida Chamber of Commerce, and, uh, and, and some of our other um, uh, nonprofits working on coastal issues. Next slide, please. We have a number of university partners engaged in this as well. Uh, there are uh, universities all over the state of Florida that are really that are working on this from an environmental perspective, from a built environment perspective, um, and we we tried to engage all of those different uh, partners in this discussion. Next slide, please. So I want to switch gears now and talk a little bit about um, a complementary project that we're working on related to uh, adaptation planning. Um, this specifically relates to some of the policy work. In 2011, uh, the Florida legislature passed the Community Planning Act, which made significant changes to how, states, uh, how the state interacts with local governments during the local comprehensive planning process. Um, and in addition to that, some optional language regarding adaptation action areas was regarded or, or was added specifically to the language associated with um, local comprehensive plans, so related to the to the requirements and, and, and suggestions for local comprehensive plans and, and the um, enforced statutes. And uh, an, an adaptation action area, which is which is the, the language that was added, is an optional comprehensive plan designation for areas that experience coastal flooding and that are vulnerable to the related impacts of rising sea levels for the purpose of prioritizing funds for infrastructure needs and adaptation planning. So both for uh, an incentive uh, for prior prioritizing funding for infrastructure needs and for uh, the planning side of it as well. Uh, local governments that adopt an adaptation action area may consider policies within the coastal management element of their local comprehensive plan to improve resiliency to coastal flooding. And uh, so the language specifically, uh, I have the language, I've, I've given you kind of a synopsis of, of the adaptation action area, but um, you can see here uh, the specific references in Florida statute to the adaptation action area. Uh, next slide, please. 
here's a little bit, uh, here's another reference to those adaptation um, action area, uh, to the adaptation action area language. Um, it's worth pointing out there that uh, we do talk about the impacts of rising sea level uh, three different times in um, in state statute. Um, but also it's worth pointing out that this is an optional um, comprehensive plan designation. So it takes action at the local level for um, for something like this to uh, to come into play. Um, next slide, please. So we found, you know, some of the, the overall benefits or some of the things associated with the adaptation action area language. Um, one is, you know, it really it did provide the statutory authority for the statewide initiative. Um, we had the, we were working on the community resiliency initiative, and this complemented it very well. So, uh, you know, this is this really is the statutory um, uh, authority for for the work we're doing under that five year initiative. Um, it also encourages communities to address um, adaptation action areas and. Um, combined with the science available, the, the different scientific reports and, um, and vulnerability information available to local governments, it gives coast, coastal communities in Florida a sound basis for action. So it gives us something to, um, to kind of take forward and, and, um, and, and stand on whenever they're suggesting action in their communities. And um, it ties adaptation planning or, or adaptation to sea level rise with, the, with land use and decision making through the Coastal Comprehensive Plan, as well as uh, you know, options for prioritizing funding for infrastructure improvements um, in these areas that may be significantly impacted in the future. Next slide. So in order to explore a little bit more um, about the adaptation action area language, we um, uh, are working on a, a complementary project to the Community Resiliency Initiative, which is called a project of special merit under the 309 strategy NOAA funding, um, uh, NOAA, NOAA um, coastal programs. And uh, it, we're, it's called Implementing Adaptation um, Action Area Policies in Florida. We're partnering with the uh, City of Fort Lauderdale, the Broward County, um, South Florida Regional Planning Council, and the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Compact to really answer the question, what is an adaptation action area? So we have this language and statute, and for a local government that sees this language for the first time, what is it and what could they possibly do with that language at the local level? So the way we did this is, uh, you know, our first, the first step in this process was to research um, everything under the sun that a local government could do policy related with the language adaptation action area. And, um, you know, the, that, that really, there's a, there's a number of things that folks can do uh, from land use decisions and, and potentially uh, uh, steering growth away from highly vulnerable areas down to uh, incentivizing or prioritizing infrastructure projects in these areas that would uh, mitigate or um, the impacts to, to coastal inundation or adapt to, to coastal inundation. So um, we have, a, we have a, a big list of, of different things the local governments can do. And then working with the city of Fort Lauderdale specifically in Broward County, we asked the city of Fort Lauderdale to, to look at those policy options and then move forward and, um, and adapt lang or adopt language into the local comprehensive plan regarding adaptation action areas. So that's, uh, that's where we are right now. The city of Fort Lauderdale has selected some language, and they are working right now to, uh, on public meetings. And they have had, had a great response from their public meetings. Um, to, to incorporate that language into the local comprehensive plan. And at the end of that, uh, we're going to develop another piece of guidance. And um, that's basically going to cover, you know, uh, what are your options? Um, what are your policy options at the local level regarding adaptation action area? Um, what the city of Fort Lauderdale did uh, in, during their process uh, to adopt adaptation action areas, all the way down to their public involvement components and then how they went about doing that. So it, it really kind of um, describes that process and gives local governments um, uh, some, some guidance on moving forward. And we're doing that through different ways. We're going to be providing um, uh, some, some print guidance, or not printed, but some, some online guidance associated with that that folks can read. But we're also going to be doing a short video that describes adaptation action areas. And uh, we'll be putting together some um, little snippets or, or podcast type presentations where, you know, if I were, um, so, with, uh, with interviews with different players at the local level and regional level that were involved in this process. So say as a uh, city official or city, um, uh, city administrator, why was this important to me? As a elected official, why is this important to me? As a planner, why is this important to me? And uh, these, these folks at the local level that worked on this will answer that question so that other folks that are uh, looking to become engaged in this process could understand why, uh, uh, from their perspective, they felt like it was, a, it was an, in, an issue they should address. Next slide, please. This really, um, 
this gives you an overview of some of our work related to the Community Resiliency Initiative and, uh, and Adaptation Action Areas. But I want to emphasize again that there are other state agencies in Florida that are doing great work related to adaptation. Um, and if you have specific questions about other projects, I'm happy to get you connected with those individuals and uh, get you in touch with our partners. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk to you a little bit today about what we're doing in Florida. And I've appreciated the opportunity to listen to what the other states are doing. And, uh, and um, thank you. Julie, thank you very much. OK, let's keep moving on. Um, our next speaker is uh, Zoe. And let me get her on board. Okay, it's a pleasure to be here and follow those two great speakers. My name is Zoe Johnson, and uh, I work here at the state of Maryland with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. I have been here for about 15 years um, working on all sorts of aspects related to climate change, but, but most notably, um, you know, issues associated with sea level rise and coastal storms. Um, you know, and that we're mo that's where Maryland is most vulnerable. And so we've made our most progress um, in pursuing policies and, and planning and, and steps on the ground to address those issues. So I wanted to share um, a little bit about what we're doing in Maryland and where we are. A slightly different um, form, form of a presentation. I really want to share with you some of the strategies that we're implementing and what that looks like in terms of um, new policy and, and efforts and, and activities or even on the ground efforts. Um, uh, you know, to help build resilience. So um, Maryland um, is already, you know, as, as other parts of the country, experiencing, you know, consequences or impacts associated with climate change. So we've had over a foot of sea level rise here in the Chesapeake Bay over the last century, and, and we're, you know, starting to see, or we have seen for the last 10 or, you know, 15 years, changes to our landscape on Maryland's eastern shore as a result of that change. Um, we're starting to see increases in our, um, you know, water temperature within the Chesapeake Bay, which is, you know, you know causing problems for harmful algal blooms and, and um, you know, other issues during the summer uh, events, uh, such as fish die off and dissolve off oxygen problems. And then, uh, you know, uh, like other places around the country, uh, particularly in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, um, you know, we've had a series of coastal storms such as Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Isabel, um, Irene, Lee, Floyd, um, over the years that really have demonstrated um, the vulnerability of our region to, you know, extreme coastal storms um, and really foreshadow the type of impacts that we're concerned about, um, you know, moving into the future. I should mention that on each of my slides where I can, I, I've inserted sort of a, a link where you can find more specific information on the topic uh, for each slide. Um, but as we look forward, we know that you know, we're you know, going to become more and more vulnerable to the impacts that we're already starting to see. Um, we have you know, we, we, our current sea level rise projections, which were, which were released last summer, um, you know, project that we could see anywhere between two to six feet of sea level rise. We have an ongoing uh, land subsidence problem in the Chesapeake Bay, which is, which is exacerbating the rate of sea level rise. Um, increases in temperature, changes in precipitation, and where those become a real issue for Maryland is um, how it could exacerbate or complicate um, or compromise our ability to achieve our bay water quality restoration goals in, in the timing of, of the runoff um, or the amount of, of sediment entering the bay uh, through the Susquehanna River and, 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 and through sediment um, that's held behind, held behind some of our dams in the, in the, in, that feed into the Chesapeake. So we're really concerned about um, you know, the water quality impacts, our ability to achieve our bay restoration goals, as well as you know, the inundation or submergence of, of low-lying lands that's happening gradually over time, as well as the vulnerability of our coastal communities to you know, any given uh, storm event. So um, you know, like California, like Florida, like a lot of other states, we've done a lot of planning. Uh, we've put out a lot of documents. Um, we have a Climate Change Commission in Maryland. Under that Climate Change Commission, there's a scientific and technical working group. They've put out two reports, one on an assessment of the climate impacts, and the second this last summer, as I mentioned, on updating our sea level rise projections. Uh, we have a greenhouse gas and carbon mitigation working group. They put out this comprehensive greenhouse gas reduction strategy, and uh, we passed Maryland's Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act in 2009. It commits us to a goal of reducing our greenhouse gases by 25% by 2020 by, from 20, 2006 levels. And we're deep in the process of, of implementing those reduction strategies. Um, 
And then on the adaptation side, and that's where you know the, the work that I coordinate in conjunction with a lot of other state agencies, as well as partners that I'll talk about in a minute, um, we've really released we've released three reports since 2008. One was a strategy focused just on sea level rise and coastal storms. The sec second covered a number of other sectors, and and then the third this last summer um, was a, a report on where we are uh, with respect to implementing our adaptation. Uh, strategies that are laid out in those two two other reports, as well as sort of our priorities for moving forward. Like California, we've used a sector-based adaptation planning approach to develop our plans and strategies. Um, we use this framework, you know, to bring together stakeholders and researchers and policymakers to formulate, you know, and set priorities for for actions that we should undertake at the state level, and also to work with coastal communities or, or local governments on on similar issues. But um, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, on those working groups, we really, and as we've moved forward with implementing specific strategies across a number of those sectors, we have realized that we're working with a whole set of, of entities, you know, and, and, and people and, and organizations, and, and, and it and helped us to sort of um, begin to, um, this isn't a formal network, this adaptation network that you see here before you, but it's a way, a way of, when you reach out to folks and, and talk to them about their work on adaptation, how they can begin to see from with whatever role they're playing or whatever they're interested in, in, interested in, that they're part of a larger network of folks in Maryland that are working um, together on climate adaptation issues. And so um, we are looking at, at ways of, of you know, creating a more formal network and, and ways of collaborating, co collaborating with these folks. There's been a, a number of informal collaborations that have sprung up in the last year, one on climate change communication, a number of community of practice groups that are looking at specific issues on, our, on Maryland's eastern shore, some within regional planning organizations. But we really need to, to think a little bit more how to, how to ca capitalize on all this interest and all this involvement you know, in, in to continue to, to support each other. So um, in terms of strategies here that I'm going to talk about in a minute, I wanted to just say that there isn't one, um, you know, one, everybody knows this, uh, a silver bullet or a specific strategy that, that, that you can undertake at the state or local level to, to address climate change impacts. But there are a number of, of puzzle pieces that are fit together to kind of create a comprehensive look or help you look more comprehensively at climate change adaptation. You know, obviously issues in transportation planning, shoreline buffer area management planning, emergency disaster, there's all sorts of activities. And so I'm just going to highlight a few of these uh, the, the efforts under some of these puzzle pieces to give you a flavor of, of some of the activities. Um, in terms of land use planning, Secretary Hall, who you've heard from at the beginning in Maryland Department of Planning, uh, the, we're, we're the lead for this major statewide uh, planning effort, uh, I think it was in 2012, to release what's called Plan Maryland, which is our state development plan. And in Plan Maryland, it was a real opportunity to begin to look at how uh, climate change issues uh, should be examined uh, with respect to promoting sustainable land use in vulnerable areas. So optional areas uh, for local governments um, to consider in making decisions about future growth and development and where that would occur at the local level um, are areas, these special preservation conservation planning areas called climate change impact areas. So they include you know, our sea level rise zones, our wildfire priority risk areas, our drought hazard risk areas, and our high quality cold water resource areas, these would be our brook trout streams in western Maryland. And hopefully coming online soon will be our climate sensitive wildlife and rare habitat species. But this is really a way of beginning to get this information out to local communities as well as providing state policymakers with overlays that they can then, you know, take the next step, you know, in the future at looking how decisions about growth and development um, you know, play or intersect with, with these areas that we're most concerned about in terms of impacts of climate change in the future. Um, we have issued a lot of planning guidance that goes along with each of those planning areas, the climate change impact areas, but also this guidance can be, um, you know, you, it can be utilized by local communities or, or fairly technical partners. Everyone uh, comments that these fact sheets are a little heavy on text and, and pretty scientifically technical, um, so they're not for the general public, but really they're for, for anyone that's interested in looking and at, at examining a specific issue or undertaking, um, you know, adaptation work under different uh, sectors. These are condensed four-page versions of each of the chapters that we're in 
uh, sort of that phase two and phase one uh, climate adaptation plan that I mentioned at the beginning. But really, on the back side of each of these fact sheets are the steps that, that the state or local governments can take to, to implement or, or to begin to build resilience to these impacts. Um, another one of those puzzle pieces is to promote sustainable shoreline and buffer area management. We realize that our natural resources and our natural shorelines, you know, bay, our bay islands, our barrier beaches, our sandy beaches, our, our buffer, you know, vegetated buffers provide this, and our wetlands provide this inherent protection to the impacts of, of storms in the Chesapeake Bay. So, and we're starting to see, you know, over the past, you know, 10, 15 years, a greater need or a greater desire for, for property owners to, to install, you know, hardened shore protection uh, structures to, to control erosion and protect property. So in uh, 2008, we passed legislation here in Maryland to require living shorelines, which are these non, there's a picture of one on the right-hand side, uh, which are these non-structural um, shore protection practices. Uh, to help control erosion and provide um, natural habitat, you know, along the way. So those now are the preferred option, and we're, we're doing a lot of technical assistance and education and training on the use of these practices, as well as monitoring the su success of these practices over time. We're working to increase our vegetated and forested buffers wherever we can. Um, we're promoting the use of erosion or elevation-based setbacks to site permanent structures, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more t detail with respect to state structures. And then we're, we're working a lot on how to designate and protect wetland and, and wildlife migration corridors. So on that note, um, a major strategy for natural resources also is how to facilitate this movement of our coastal and inland ecosystems in Maryland. So as sea level rises, wetlands, tidal wetlands will move farther inland in response to sea level rise as well as, as you know, as long as there's not a hardened structure, a barrier, a road, a home, um, or a greater, you know, a, a hard topographic break, natural topographic break, I should say. Um, but we are working now to identify areas where these wetlands will migrate in based on this high resolution um, modeling uh, that we worked with NOAA and other partners in, in USGS to develop. And, and, and identify these areas and target them for uh, conservation uh, and preservation purposes. So we have a number of, of shifts in our land conservation policies here in Maryland to help us do that. Uh, we recently inco incorporated all these wetland, uh, wetland adaptation areas into our targeting for land conservation. And we're developing a couple new easement uh, programs and, and, uh, and, uh, to help us you know, protect these, these key areas. So uh, we, we created something called the Coastal Resilience Easement. Uh, we've, we've implemented a few of these, um, but really we're learning along the way. But some of the provisions that go into these easements uh, would be development setbacks for areas, you know, to, to, to restrict development in areas that would be inundated by the year 2050, increase those buffers, as I talked about, to, to protect those wetland adaptation areas, um, reduce, increasing impervious surface limits to control erosion um, and runoff, you know, to account for, you know, increased storm events. Uh, we want to make sure that we can, the state has the ability as the, as the easement owner to, to review the type of shoreline stabilization project that goes in there so we can give that preference to living shorelines, as I mentioned. And then call, we can call for the update of, of soil conservation water quality plans to every 10 years. Um, so it's just a kind, of, kind of an idea of how we, we're taking, you know, an existing easement program and, and, and creating kind of a new, a new you know, type uh, to, to incorporate uh, and help us achieve some of these strategies that we've laid out. Another major strategy is to enhance siting and design for our coastal infrastructure. So in 2012, Governor O'Malley signed an executive order um, called Climate Change and Coast Smart Construction and asked the state to take a look at its infrastructure and siting design standards for state-funded infrastructure. Uh, and so we had a working group that met for over a year uh, to, to lay out a set of, of deciding and design guidelines for, for state infrastructure investments. And then hot off the press last week, um, Maryland House Bill 615 passed the Maryland General Assembly. We're waiting for it to be signed um, into law, but it creates a formal Coastmark Council in statute to continue work um, on uh, finalizing these infrastructure siting and design guidelines and to continue working on developing additional criteria to guide um, uh, all, you know, guide, you know, state investment decisions uh, for, for capital projects in areas vulnerable to sea level rise and coastal flooding. 
So just to give you a flavor of some of the citing guidelines uh, that, that the report um, you know, highlighted was you know, citing guidelines are where you build. So the report basically recommends um, that you know, new structures or you know, reconstruction of substantially damaged structures, we really should be avoiding placing those within areas that are vulnerable to sea level rise over the next 50 years. And that new state critical essential facilities be outside of areas, that, you know, outside the 100-year floodplain and, and protected at least from, uh, from the damage from the result of a 500-year flood. And then, it, you know, circling back to that concept of, of, of those uh, natural features that we're trying to protect, we want to make sure that uh, projects, state projects that um, you know that we're identifying those ecological features on site that can provide that that natural protection that I talked about, and protecting those features from from development or from impacts, so that we can ensure that um, that the, the features themselves you know are in place or can be we can direct mitigation activities towards enhancing those. But we also want to make sure that that any key wetland or habitat migration corridor is protected and maintained as well. Um, you know is is if any of you are involved with, um, you know, working groups and setting specific criteria for development, you know that there's always exception criteria and there's always, you know, nuances to these types of decisions. So, um, obviously, for the siting guidelines, we spent a lot of time talking about the types of exceptions that we would we would want to consider for projects that would be in that 50-year inundation zone. So, obviously, water-dependent uses, passive public access, temporary structures, stabilization projects, and and then the report goes on later to talk about the process for which we would be able to, or how the state would make make a decision about, um, you know, granting an exception for these type of projects in those areas. In terms of the design guidelines, the report recommends how to build um, state structures, and really, this, you know, the design guidelines are centered around elevating structures and, and you know, the the amount of, of freeboard, you know, dry proofing structures as well as, um, you know using uh, the LIMWA uh, provisions for coastal A zones uh, for, for projects that are in B zones in Maryland. So, you know, they're not, they're not you know, um, state-of-the-art design guidelines, but they are, you know, the, the best of the best in terms of, um, you know, guidance from FEMA on constructing uh, projects within, within vulnerable areas. And like the siting design guidelines, the siting guidelines, the design guidelines also have a series of, of exception criteria, um, you know, if you can prove that, 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 that you know, varying from these provisions would not, you know, compromise life or safety. So right now, uh, you know, the process really, um, or strategy that, we're, that you know, is, is like California, like Florida, you know, it, there's this concept of mainstreaming consideration of a lot of these strategies and principles and planning, uh, you know, efforts into uh, state policy and programs. And so the siting and design guidelines, uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, wetland adaptation guidelines, uh, you know, the, the shoreline and buffer area management guidelines, all those type of decisions are, we're working to institutionalize those or integrate them into the, our existing state policy and programs. So updating architecture, engineering, construction manuals, looking at our regulatory programs. Um, we included uh, a vulnerability assessment of climate change in our 2011 state hazard mitigation plan. In our 2014 update, we'll have an even more comprehensive look at climate change and vulnerability, um, and and how you know, uh, as Julie mentioned, we would we can use um, recovery planning, long-term recovery planning, uh, to help you know us achieve some of our resilience measures. Uh, we, we this year, um, in response to Plan Maryland that I mentioned earlier, we reviewed all capital budget uh, requests that came through the, the Maryland state capital budget and provided comment on, on climate change and, and sea level rise impacts and how those may affect uh, capital budget, budget decisions. And we're also currently looking at all our state grant and loan programs to look at how we can use those programs to help achieve greater resiliency or implementation of the, strat of the types of strategies I talked about earlier. Another major strategy is, is giving state and local governments the right tools to help them plan and adapt. You saw some great tools um, you, for, that Michael talked about in California. Um, I would say this is a, a beta version of, of CalAdapt. Um, it's all called our Climate Change Impact Area Mapper. It's the mapper that, that local governments can use to help implement uh, or identify those climate change impact areas that I talked about. Um, it houses our data on uh, wildfire risk and drought risk and hazard risk. Um, we are also working uh, through using Coastal Zone Management Act dollars, uh, like Florida, to assist our local communities um, to help them plan and adapt. 
Um, since 2009, we've been passing through money each year through competitive grants. Uh, we've worked with almost 13 uh, communities and, and, and a growing number on developing specific standalone sea level rise plans. Um, but now we're beginning to kind of merge and we're starting to see that that these communities are interested not necessarily in standalone plans, but really how to address uh, sea level rise and coastal flood issues through uh, their floodplain ordinance, their, their hazard mitigation ordinance, through looking at uh, updating their historical and cultural uh, plans. and so. We are beginning to see that standalone documents aren't necessarily the end-all, be-all when it comes to implementation, or, or you know, we can get the conversation started. But as they, as communities continue to work to implement these plans, there's new planning opportunities that present themselves, and we're try really trying to work with those communities on that. And one of the ways that that we've um, you know, are continuing to work with these communities that we've worked with in the past and, and engage new communities along the way is through. Um, a new effort called our CoSmart Community Scorecard. It's a community self-assessment tool, and it walks communities through a process of, of examining where they are, um, you know, and, and they can, you know, self-evaluate, um, you know, their progress and 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 uh, on, on being CoSmart. Um, and so there's guys, there's a, you know, fact, here's a checklist for land use planning, infrastructure critical assessments, and uh, first, you know, first and foremost would be assessing risk and vulnerability, but at the end of the process, really, you can rate yourself as being co-smart, on the right track, or getting started. But you know, this this tool, there is an online version. Um, there's a link there. Um, the the strength of this tool nece not nece is not necessarily the tool, but it's the process um, or the 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 form at which you start the tool. I mean, you start undertaking the process to go through the tool. Um, you know, through a community meeting and beginning the dialogue and, and beginning to work together. So we're, we're, we're requiring that each community that we fund now um, through our CoSmart Communities Program for a grant um, has to have to go through this community assessment process as they begin. And, and it really can be a, a strong um, community grassroots uh, process to, to undertake this, this assessment. So um, wrapping up here, I just, you know, I know we're going to kind of head into a Q&A, and, and I think, you know, you heard a lot of good presentations today, um, but I think for us in Maryland, you heard about our work, you know, we're not done, uh, we'll never be done, we're always going to be presented with new challenges and we can keep building off of what we've done in the past, but, you know, we still have some looming questions and some looming um, things that, that we're really trying to grapple with, and so I just wanted to present these here at the end to, to help, you know, you all think about questions you may want to ask, but the, the things that we're facing with is how we balance the reality of climate change and sea level rise with historic and cultural values and the need for community revitalization. We have communities like Chris Field that were devastated by Hurricane Sandy. They were already very economically depressed. And we're trying to think, how can you rebuild, recognize that they're, they're going to continue to be extremely vulnerable, but there is this tremendous historical and cultural identity of the community that we need to support. And at the same time, you know, we're grappling with this, you know, that I, you know, as I mentioned, through our, our land conservation dollars or our dollars that we're putting in for public infrastructure, how, you know, how should we be using public dollars to support um, projects in areas that are vulnerable to sea level rise um, or vulnerable to, or how can we be, you know, you know be using dollars better to help build resilience at the state and local level. And then like a lot of states and local governments, we continue to need to look at how we can catalyze um, more action at the state and local level and how we can provide more direct service to local governments um, and others that are interested in undertaking this, plan this planning process. And, and you know, there's a tremendous amount of data and information and tools, and, but you still need someone to help you or help a local government or within, from within that local government or state government undertake the work. And so I think some of the examples that Michael talked about in California, like the AmeriCorps, um, you know, option or or something like that, we have to continue to think about ways of, of providing more support, um, you know, to help to help help everybody begin to to take action. So um, I'm available as well, um, and you know, happy to answer any questions during the next section. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. Michael McCormick, Julie Dennis, and Zoe Johnson, thank you for presenting. Let's jump right into some Q&A. Um, 
so that we can get as many of these questions answered as possible. There are quite a few. But before we do that, um, all these questions are coming in. Well, we have a second poll for all of our, uh, our listeners coming in just to kind of, again, help gauge our speakers when answering some of these questions. So um, let's go ahead and move into our poll real quick, and then we can jump into those questions and answers. Okay. All right, on your screen shortly, you should um, you should see the poll coming up. Um, has your state begun planning for climate change? Let's go ahead and, and take a moment to have everyone send their votes in. Okay. So it looks like uh, from our results, 7% no, 16% started discussion, 23% progress towards plan, 25 state has developed a plan, and then the largest group of those that voted, 29% saying, not really sure. Okay. Let's move into those uh, questions and answers. Okay, great. So our first question is, um, I, I think this question is probably geared towards Michael. Um, what is the focus in California for water resources and use when the Colorado River will be stressed to maintain current water use as the climate warms? Sorry, I had a mute button issue. Um, no, that's a good question. You know, water is at the forefront of our minds right now as we're dealing with one of the worst droughts in recorded history in California. Um, it's a question we're trying to solve: is how do we how do we grow as a state demographically? As I mentioned, you know, we're we're looking at 50 million people by 2050. Uh, our current infrastructure is is um, it, it needs to continue to be supported and upgraded. Um, how do we add additional resources to actually accommodate that population growth, changing demographics, and uh, the breadbasket that California is to much of the rest of the U.S. and the world? Um, uh, we have a we have a, a drought task force currently uh, tackling many uh, many questions right now. I'm not uh, I'm not actually on the task force, so I'm not familiar with the current discussions. But uh, I know that that is a, certainly a question that that we're grappling with at this point. Okay, um, and the next question, how do we measure resilience? What metrics can we use to quantify a project, city, county, region, state's climate resilience? Well, that's something that I can talk about as well. This is Michael again. Um, you know, part of the goal of the Environmental Goals and Policy Report that I talked about in part of the presentation was looking at uh, how do we develop the indicators and metrics of success uh, around addressing climate change, where is there overlaps between greenhouse gas emissions and adaptation and resilience, and um, in general, uh, it just better quality of life for, for Californians. And uh, we've identified a number of uh, metrics and indicators to support that, and it's not, they're not the traditional indicators. So when you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, it's easy to track success to a certain extent because you have a certain number in mind that you need to get to. But with resilience, um, it's, it's much less uh, numeric in nature. Uh, so we're dealing with the number of communities that have adopted adaptation plans or uh, the level of preparedness of communities on a certain scale. You know, how well have the, the local hazard mitigation plans incorporated climate risk into 
their response and uh, procedures. You know, have they done a local energy assurance plan to make sure that they will be able to have um, energy supply if the energy grid grows down? Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of different um, metrics that we can use, but they're, they're not based on uh, a, a numeric target as much as they are on uh, establishing um, protocols uh, within our communities to be able to respond to both risk and uh, extreme shocks. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's see. This next question is for Julie. Um, Julie, I may have misheard, but I understand that we are talking about a lot of private money and private and public investment, but why in Florida would we be prioritizing funding for infrastructure for areas repeatedly hit by storms and flooding and vulnerable to impacts of sea level rise and climate change? Why would we not designate those areas for little or no public funding to steer development, redevelopment to more appropriate sites? Yeah, thank you for your question, and thank you for the opportunity to, to clarify that as well. Um, not talking about targeting for private investment um, or private funding in, in different areas. Um, whenever we were talking about the Adaptation Action Area, we were, I, I mentioned uh, two contexts. Uh, there, there's a number of contexts in which it can be used, but I've, I mentioned two. And generally, a lot of communities are, are, are using this as a way to draw a line on the map and say, this is where we consider, this is going to be our adaptation action area. This is where we consider uh, our community to be the most vulnerable. And the types of actions that they're taking, and there may be, um, they may be looking to um, prioritize funding for infrastructure improvements. I don't mean um, infrastructure improvements by, by the ways of roads and things that would necessarily enhance or allow more uh, opportunities for develop. What I mean are uh, stormwater projects and things, and that would be mostly appropriate in some of our more urban areas in southeast Florida, which are extremely vulnerable to, uh, to, to coastal inundation in some cases. Um, so that might be, um, you know, stormwater improvements. Those might be um, different, you know, relocations or rerouting or two-laning where four-laning used to exist of roads and, and different things like that. Um, but that would be funding for infrastructure improvements to mitigate um, coastal inundation in, in areas that are already developed. Um, the other side of that is, like I said, you, you, you can draw a line on a map with an adaptation action area, and other communities may choose to use that to uh, limit development. For example, um, one of our communities in, um, uh, in Florida is looking at an option to use it similar to how we use a coastal high hazard area, which is drawing a line on a map um, and then saying you know, that we're going to limit or direct uh, growth away from uh, the area um, and uh, uh, direct uh, growth away from, uh, from, from an area that's considered to be vulnerable to coastal inundation. So the Adaptation Action Area and their um, uh, scenario says that we recognize that the coastal high hazard area uh, looks at storm surge vulnerability. We think the Adaptation Action Area pushes that storm surge, or we think coastal um, inundation or sea level rise pushes that vulnerability further inland, and our Adaptation Action Area applies those same concepts of um, reducing densities and directing uh, development away from this area to a larger area that we're calling the Adaptation Action Area. Great. Thank you. And I did. I had to stop showing the screen. I'm trying to advance to show everyone's contact information, and I'm having some trouble. So yes, you are seeing a blank screen, but we'll just keep going until I would, I'm able to get it up. Um, this next question would be for Zoe. Um, curious about the ways Florida is addressing how sea level rise will affect the water table and fresh water. In Maryland, you mean? I think you said in Florida. So um, I can answer that for Maryland, though. Oh, I'm sorry, Julie. I meant Julie. But please oh, okay. go ahead for Maryland and for Florida because it's a good question. <laughs> so we are definitely starting to see increases in our water table and, and saltwater intrusion um, along Maryland's eastern shore. Uh, we're having some some issues with um, uh, potable water uh, supplies as well as failing septic systems. Uh, so it's it's definitely you know this is where the rubber meets the road in decisions about uh, um, you know extending public sewer and water to communities uh, that you need to balance that you know very carefully with one, not not necessarily encouraging new growth and development or enabling growth, but but dealing with the water quality issues that, that may come with with contaminated septic or you know. Um, failing septic systems. So um, we're, we're definitely, you know, our, our agricultural lands are starting to, um, they're losing productivity or not not able to, 
be farmed uh, because of the higher water tables and, the, and their, the ability for farmers to get in and, and farm those fields. So um, we haven't, you know, there's no specific you know, programs yet. Uh, some count, some farmers are more interested in some of these easement programs that we've been offering uh, to take some of that land that, that's no longer viable out of, out of production and, and identify where these wetland migration quarters may be. Um, we're working with the Conservation Fund to explore some um, business, uh, you know, options in terms of promoting uh, switchgrass production um, or switch switchgrass, um, uh, you know, um, plantings that to, and stimulate a market for switchgrass because it, it could be a viable crop if there was a, a viable market uh, for for growing um, you know that those in this in these in these wet areas so um, but really it, it, from a land use perspective it's going to come down to making you know very carefully balancing decisions at, at the community or the state funding level that to, to how to deal with the, with a loss of water or the or failing septic systems Great, and this is and this is Julie. Um, from, I, I agree with the comments that were just said, and from a broader perspective, um, but uh, from from Florida's perspective, we're looking at it in a similar way. Um, our coastal environment, our coastal areas that are uh, subject to um, uh, uh, saltwater intrusion, um, that's it's presenting issues from an environmental perspective and a habitat perspective, and those are largely being handled by our Florida uh, Wildlife Commission, and it's also being um, uh, presented, you know, as a as an issue affecting our water supply. And I'd say that the, the folks that have um, been most active in looking at that have been, has been the, the South, um, Southeast Florida Water Management District, and they've, uh, they've done a significant uh, amount of research associated with that uh, specifically. I don't, um, I'm, that's not my area of expertise, but I would love to um, get whoever has that question in contact with um, uh, Jancy Opisukera over at the South uh, Florida Water Management District, and he could answer questions related to, uh, related to saltwater intrusion and water supply. All right, um, two more questions. I know it looks like we're, we're ready to run out of time. Um, Julie, how many communities um, have developed plans for adaptation action areas? Right now, you know, it's, it's a fairly uh, new uh, piece of uh, language. So right now we've only um, had it in statute for about, um, I guess it's 2011, so it's been about two and a half, three years now. And uh, we have a number of communities that are working towards it, but we don't have anyone that has actually adopted that language specifically yet. But I'd say we have about um, about five to six right now that are in different stages of adopting um, adaptation action area language into um, into their current um, planning documents. We also have a number of other communities that have done um, broader adaptation plans, and I'd say we probably have about another handful of communities that have done um, adaptation plans from a, from a broader perspective, um, looking at it uh, not specifically as language associated with the local comprehensive plan, but from a, um, from a separate uh, document. OK, um, we'll, this we'll this ask Michael to, oh, go ahead. to the original question. Oh, sorry, the, the question I got a little bit earlier about water, the resource for that is water.ca.gov. Um, and it'll have uh, our approach to addressing some of our uh, resource constraints right now on that website. Great. Thank you. Um, we'll ask one more question, and this one will be for um, Michael, Julie, and Zoe. Um, how do you deal with community business-related pushbacks or non-support based on the arguments of associated increasing costs as well as reduction in property value if the areas in which they're located are designated as potential climate impact areas? Any suggestions, particularly for loss in market value of property? Well, in California, we've, we've um, uh, our coastal management agencies have done quite a bit of work at looking uh, at uh, the discussion of sea level rise and associated impacts on uh, private and public property. Um, I think that's a that's a really deep question, and I don't know if we have the time to address it here today. But I would suggest looking at the California Coastal Commission's new coastal development permit and local coastal plan guide guidance documents. Um, we also have the Bay Conservation and Development Commission has done quite a bit of work around that. And we also have a narrative and suggested best practices in the Ocean Protection Council's sea level rise guidance document. Um, and I think those are three great resources to, um, uh, to get to that uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit deeper. 
Yeah, and, and uh, this is Zoe. In Maryland, we've been trying to communicate, you know, we just had this legislative session where we were trying to pass that CoSmart Council bill. Um, when there were a lot of, even though it didn't address public investments, there was a lot of concern from state legislators that, you know, it could or would it, um, and what would that mean, um, as well as what would it mean for a public investment to be, you know, uh, evaluated or, or restricted within a certain area. So there definitely is concern. Um, it comes down to communicating risk um, and the building resilience into the design of a structure. Now, there may be additional costs, but you're offsetting risk in the future. Um, there doesn't sound to be yet general you know, consensus or support for identifying areas where we may want to retreat, even though that, that you know, it will likely be you know, uh, you know, 50 or 100 years down the road, um, you know, something we need to think more seriously about. It doesn't sound like there's general you know, p local support for those types of decisions yet, yet we know that, that they're pressing. Um, but I would say the same thing is that our guidance document for, for infrastructure siting and design on the back end, this very end, has a sort of a checklist that you can sort of walk through. And, and it talks about looking at the, the long-term costs and benefits of, of making decisions about, um, you know, uh, placing a structure within an area that may be vulnerable. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up now. I know we're a few minutes after, and I'm just going to turn it over to uh, Secretary Hall for some final comments. Thank you. Uh, just a few quick points, and if you look at the uh, slides up on your screen now, you can get the, the gist of it. Um, first, I want to thank everyone uh, for participating, uh, especially the speakers. Uh, the um, Collaborative um, will host um, this video and related materials on its website. We also will be following up with you uh, next week to uh, seek uh, input for future webinars and other activities of the Collaborative. And lastly, um, the Collaborative will be having what we call facilitated discussions or an open conversation at the APA conference later this month in Atlanta. It's a it's a 1 p.m. at 1 p.m. Sunday the 27th, the 27th, now at the National Conference. So thanks again, and have a great weekend.